Welcome to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic where you submit your questions to us using social media and the hashtag AskGCNTech and then we do our best to answer them. So without further ado, let's crack on. I've got my brew ready for this week. The first question comes from Umaraisu, Umaraisu Di2 uh, who says, Hi GCN Tech, first of all, love the show but I'm not fortunate enough to store my bike indoors. I keep a cover on it, to try and protect it, um, but he's discovered little cracks in his tires appearing, and he's wondering if leaving his bike outside is gonna cost him extra money due to faster corrosion of the tires. Um, does this happen if you keep your tires indoors? Right, well, it can have an impact. In general, leaving your bike outside is not an ideal situation, and Actually, if you've got a nice bike, DI2, um, it's something I would absolutely say do not do because it will end up uh, causing quicker wear and damage to it. UV rays um, will accelerate wear on things like paint and um, also ru some rubber compounds, although more modern rubber compounds generally are more UV resistant than older rubber compounds. Also wind, rain, fluctuations in temperature can all accelerate wear and corrosion on your bike and things like rust. So if you can keep your bike indoors, and I appreciate you might not be able to, but as a rule of thumb, I mean, if it's an expensive bike and you don't have, you know, the, the option of keeping it indoors, then, I would try and fix that. Um, it's a, I would say it's okay to keep a, a hack bike that you maybe commute on outside, but a nice one, I mean, apart from the theft issue, yes, this can be a problem. Regarding your tires, uh, specifically your tires, like I say, in my experience, even with hack bikes with cheap tires on that I've kept outside, that's not been an issue. So there might be something else going on there. Maybe a solvent you've used to clean the bike could have cracked the tires. That might be something worth looking at and investigating. But usually the tire tread wears down before the tire fails. And what you might be seeing might just be cosmetic wear on the tires anyway. Um, I mean, I do feel your pain a bit because I've lived in places where I was supposedly not allowed to keep a bike indoors, but they were people who, they weren't cycling people like us. They didn't understand that it wasn't just a cheap, you know, rubbish bike. It was a piece of art. So I used to just smuggle it into my room at university anyway. They never knew. <laughs> Next question is from Emery Reagan, who says, Hi Ollie, I've just bought Pev Speedplay pedals and I'm having a hard time unclipping and clipping in. Can you help? Well, yeah, uh, well, just done a video on Speedplay pedals, came out a couple of days ago, so check that out. Um, I love Speedplays, you can see I've got more bike. These are the one-sided ones, but they're the aero fans of pants ones. Um, so yes, when you first get the cleats, they can be a little stiff, but in my experience, this is fixed by putting some dry lube, like I show in that other video, um, onto your cleats, and that should allow for more easy engagement. But yes, I too have experienced it where they've been quite stiff uh, and hard to clip in. But yeah, and the comments are gonna go wild now that I've mentioned lube yet again. Um, I'm actually thinking about growing my lockdown hair and just keep growing it into a mullet, and then, um, calling myself Ollie Exotic and being known as the Lube King. Next question from Andrew Holmes, who says, more of a clothing tech question, it's okay, we do those too. Um, do base layers actually help you keep, keep you cooler? Because I always struggle with overheating and I normally only go out in a jersey. Right, so it's very personal in terms of what clothing works for different people, different you know, people find that certain things work better at certain temperature ranges. But um, base layers like this are designed to help keep you cooler in certain conditions. So this is one of my nice GCN Castelli base layers. And base layers like this are usually made from a very specific fabric that's designed to wick moisture away from your skin and sort of help the sweating process. So when you sweat, that's one of your body's mechanisms for cooling you down. And water is brilliant at transferring heat and taking it away from your body. It's why water is used as a coolant in nuclear reactors. But the mesh in these base layers will therefore is sort of thought to be better than taking that water off your skin and then allowing it to evaporate 
sort of by also providing a large surface area in these kind of fabrics. But this kind of uh, wicking fabric is also found on the jersey as well, albeit in key locations. So you can see on a typical jersey, you will have like wicking areas, maybe under the arms and on the back, because that's where most of your sweat glands are. So you can actually see on this Castelli jersey that there is this wicking fabric on the back. But then modern jersey design wants to be aerodynamic as well. So you have less wicking fabrics where you don't sweat as much, but are, um, you know, the, the fabric is more important that it's aerodynamic in the wind and has low drag. So things like on the sleeves and on the chest, you'll have more aerodynamic fabrics. And that's a, the way a lot of cycling clothing is made these days. What I would say is that me personally, in my experience, I would wear a base layer up to about 23, 22 degrees Celsius. Beyond that, I too get too hot and I'll just wear a jersey. And you see a lot of pros kind of doing this same sort of thing. But go out, experiment, uh, find what works for you, and wear sunscreen. Next question is from Carlo Vermeulen, who says, I've been looking at getting a pedal-based power meter, but I'm concerned that they wear out after two or three years. Do they have replaceable pedal bodies? I guess this is in response to last week's tech clinic where I spoke about pedal bodies uh, wearing out. I'll pedal here. Um, my personal recommendation, and this is my personal recommendation, um, is that yes, pedal bodies on power meters can wear out as they can on regular pedals. I do know that certain particular models, the bodies can't be replaced. I'm not sure if that's the case on every single pedal-based power meter though. Um, and also different power meter locations have relative advantages and disadvantages. And there are a lot of advantages to pedal-based power meters. That said, my personal recommendation is for a spider-based unit. Um, and that's simply because they normally offer a very sort of accurate measurement. Um, it's quite, it's a more simple place to measure power than a pedal. There's less going on there. There's less input strains. Um, and in my experience, they just tend to last longer. Um, and it's that thing of, they can be more expensive, but it's that classic buy, buy, uh, buy cheap, buy twice um, kind of adage. So in the long run, it, it can be more cost effective to buy a slightly more expensive power meter that's sort of crank based or spindle based. But yeah, um, just something worth considering, I'd say. Next question is from One Inch Legend, AKA Iceberg. I'm not gonna ask. Um, who says, hey man on Ollie, I've had a biking accident recently with my girlfriend. The girlfriend is fine, phew, but the bike is broken. Uh, it's always the innocent ones that get hurt. What's your girlfriend done that, make it, that makes her not innocent? Anyway, <laughs> he says his rear derailleur hanger has broken in two and his bike is quite uh, a niche brand, Villager of Switzerland. Is that Villager or Villager? I think it might be Villager. There's a famous chemist called Villager who part invented the Bayer-Villager reaction. Um, classic bit of chemistry there. Um, and he says it's an old 90s frame. Yeah, classic thing this. When you, when, you loot, when you break a mech hanger and you try and source one, it's one of the most annoying things about the bike industry, apart from the fact that there are about a billion, million bottom bracket standards. There's even more rear mech hangers. <laughs> like every single frame seems to have a different rear mech hanger. There are companies out there that do specialize in helping people like you, one inch legend. Um, <laughs> because this is a thing. Um, but yours, you make a suggestion that you have, uh, I mean, rear mech hangers are like jigsaw pieces. So it's going to be impossible to find. Um, but yes, there are companies that do specialize in helping people in your situation. So a quick Google search should put you on the right path there. But your idea of getting one that kind of looks similar and then maybe machining it down to bodge it to make it fit, that'd be a hack. That would, that would work if you did it properly. And also your idea about making one, I mean, if, if, if you have access to a CNC milling machine, which you say you do have a CNC machine, if it's a milling machine, that would be amazing because that'd be the perfect tool for making one. And if you do do that, I would be massively impressed and I think that'd be really cool in a tech geeky kind of way. So please send some pictures of it in and let us see it because that should be celebrated, that kind of bike maintenance behavior and uh, submit it to Hacks and Bodgers on the app. Definite hack. Um, Super says, should you lube the free, another lube question, for God's sake. 
Super says, should you lube the free hub body before installing the cassette cogs? Right. So just to be clear and avoid any confusion on this matter, right? Your question could mean two things. So inside the free hub body, if you remove the free hub body as you would to service uh, your free hub, then yes, you should lube inside that as per the manufacturer's instructions. Different free hub manufacturers recommend different kinds of lube. For example, uh, SRAM will often say that, well, you should put a, a light mineral oil in the zip free hubs and some of the brands do this as well whereas other brands will say a thick grease should be applied such as dt swiss um, but yes in general something like the kind of park tool high performance uh, grease which i've got in my lube box this kind of stuff that that's going to be ideal for most free hub bodies uh, internally but what your question could also refer to is the splines on the free hub body onto which the cassette slots on now this is, these aren't two surfaces moving against each other, so you don't want a high performance grease really on here. If you're in a pinch, you could use this kind of stuff, It'd be better than nothing. But what you're really doing by lubricating that part is to stop it seizing and stopping your cassette um, seizing onto the free hub body, which will make removal of it at a later date uh, more difficult. So you want to use a, um, an anti-seize compound, uh, a specific lube that, that does that, like what you'd put on your threads of your pedals, something like that would be my recommendation in that location. So I hope that uh, answers your question. You don't need much on there either. Uh, monk edit edits, oh monk edits, it's a monk that just edits. Um, can you clip on tri bars to flatter more aero handlebars available on the market? I'm worried about clamping onto these aero bars as it could damage the carbon fiber because of the flatter profile. Yes, you're absolutely right and you should be worried and yes, it is an issue. So like on my uh, Pinarello behind me, it's got a beautiful aero cockpit. Oh, the, the hair, just cover that back up, um, which is great, the most aero bar and stem. But yes, this is a problem, a first world problem, albeit, on modern, a lot of modern bikes with these beautiful integrated bars and stems. There are some options out there you can buy um, where people are making tri bars that can clip onto these surfaces. I know on Canyon can handle bars, there are some products specifically for Canyon ones, but you're very limited in your tri bar options when you go down this route. If I was desperate to get tri bars on my Pinarello, what I would actually do is remove the proprietary bar and stem, and I would put on a standard bar and a, um, a, round, a round bar and a standard stem. And this would allow me to clip on some tri bars. The thinking being that I, I, I've not, I, wouldn't ha I don't have to measure it in a wind tunnel, I know, because your body position makes the most difference aerodynamically, that it will be more aerodynamic to have tri bars on a round non-aero bar and be able to get into this position than riding a more aerodynamic cross-sectioned aero bar in a normal road bike position. So I guess, well, yeah, consider that. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and uh, yeah, you can get more aero on your bike. Uh, Thomas A says, a bit of a weird question. I have a saddlebag with Velcro straps and it's fallen off my bike even when I tighten it down as much as possible. Any thought? That's not a weird question at all. Velcro can wear out. Um, I'm trying to look where my saddlebag is. Hopefully it's not dropped off. Um, and it sounds like that's happened to you. I'd, I'd say simply replace your saddlebag or if you're crafty or you've got any friends that are good at craft, then maybe just take off the Velcro straps and put some new ones on and um, you know, work, work good as new, I'd reckon. Last question this week, sorry guys, uh, is from David Chisholm who says, how often or how do I know when to replace jockey wheels in my derailleur? I've been doing this exact thing this week. So this is one of my rear derailleurs. It's a nice one, uh, nice fancy Jura Ace one. Um, I'm very lucky. But watch what happens when I try and clean, when I try and turn this bottom jockey wheel. You see that? It just doesn't want to move. It's come quite seized, it's just worn out. It has done about 20,000 plus kilometers through this in all types of weather. And although I have cleaned it regularly um, and looked after it, they do wear out. Jockey wheels, 
they uh, they get a lot of abuse. They're in a part of your bike where, I mean, they're exposed to loads of dirt and moisture and crap off the road. They also turn about a million times more every for every revolution of your wheel, the jockey wheels turn um, a lot more. So yeah, they have to be replaced. The best thing to do, take off your chain um, and then that gives you an opportunity to clean your chain, but then also gives you an opportunity to try and spin the jockey wheels and see what sort of state they're in. If uh, they are like mine are here, these simply, I mean, I've had a look at these, the bearings are okay, they just, they're lacking a bit of grease. So I'm gonna re, um, well, I'm just gonna take them out uh, by undoing these Allen bolts on the cage, which releases the jockey wheels. And then you can take them apart, service them and put some grease in. We have a video showing you how to do it. Or you can just replace your jockey wheels completely. Um, usually on most rear mechs, they're not very expensive to replace, but that's an easier thing to do in many cases. Um, but yes, that would be how you would know. In terms of how long it takes them to wear out, it's that classic, how long's a piece of string. If you ride in a very dry, clean place, they will last a very long time, like just, you know, indoors. But if you ride in England through dirt, rain, salt, and all that, good stuff, they'll probably wear out a lot quicker. In case you're wondering, and I appreciate some people might be who watch this, this is a rear mech hanger. This is a part that attaches your frame to the rear derailleur on the back of your bike. Now, the rear mech hanger is a sacrificial part. You can see this one. See, it's thin there where it attaches onto the frame. And it's designed to break when you crash and land on it. This is so, this breaks like a crumple zone, meaning that your bike doesn't snap or break and your rear mech doesn't snap or break. So it is meant to be a sacrificial part. But considering it is meant to be a sacrificial part, it's annoying that they're not more easily found. Um, <laughs> that every single one seems to be different. Thanks for your question. I hope that answers it. And I hope I've managed to answer everyone else's question. If I haven't got round to answering your question this week, sorry about that. Um, but keep them coming in and I'll do my best to answer it in a subsequent show. It's always a pleasure to answer you guys' questions and, and help solve your problems. Um, use the hashtag AskGCNTech down below. I'm now going to continue growing my uh, Lube King mullet and uh, drinking my brew. And um, yeah, maybe watch some more GCN videos as well. Watch the one on speed play pedals if you want. Be good. Yeah. Bye.